Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, things to keep in mind when you're preparing civvy and how we prepared our civvy. Um, uh, so I'll start with a little bit of what I think of as the groundwork, um, then look a bit more at um, planning the structure of the structure of it, basically, and um, then um, I want to talk a little bit about um, avoiding redundant data and and making the most of the s structures that are available in Civi rather than just making everything a custom field, for instance. Um, and then if I've got time, I'll talk very quickly about the actual migration process um, and we might have some questions at the end. Um, so first of all, um, um, users want to know why you're doing the conversion, why you why you're moving to CV. Um, not just users, of course, but your management and so forth. Um, and um, I remember there was um, there was a I'll put a quote here from it's the best I could find. It was from Friedrich Nietzsche. <laughs> um, so I saw a quite a nice TED talk. Um, by Simon Sinek, um, who who explains how, for instance, Apple Apple advertise quite effectively by saying why they do what they do, um, rather before they tell you how they do it or what they actually do. Um, so that works quite well for us. It works quite well in fundraising communications as well. Um, so don't tell them what you're doing. Tell them that you really believe that you know everyone has the right to freedom and you know. A um, good life. Um, so, so for example, I would say we would say something like, "We're moving to CV because we want our staff and volunteers to be able to serve our clients better." Um, and you can leave it at that and and tell your press for more information. Um, but it's much better than starting with saying, "You know, we really need these custom data fields and and reports and so on," um, because they won't really take it on board and they'll. They'll think that secretly you're doing it for some other reason, like to save money or you know some other reason, um, even if you are. Um, so, um, <coughs> ah, let's see how my slides going. Um, um, so, in terms of the groundwork, um, I've just picked a few a few things to discuss. Um, one is Drupal versus WordPress, um, which has come up a little bit today. Um, we have a WordPress website, as I said earlier, but we um, went with Drupal because we'd heard the security was good um, and we heard that developers like Drupal and users like WordPress. Yes? Um, we're, we're in the same position. We have WordPress for our content site, Drupal for city, and, and Part of the reason we did that, apart from the fact that the WordPress port wasn't really there when we moved, yeah. um, was that having them on different systems yeah. potentially does give you a bit of security. If one's compromised, the other isn't. As sure. Do you want to comment on that? Or? Um, well, it is an advantage, for sure. Um, the, there's not much of a disadvantage. Um, we went with Drupal because um, our main developer had used it. Um, we told it was good and so on. Um, we wanted something developer friendly, um, but that's not to say WordPress is not developer friendly. <laughs> um, and um, and because of Drupal Web Forms, um, so Caldera Forms wasn't really on our horizon at the time, um, but it is now, um, and um, we're really tossing up at the moment whether to move Civi, move our database across, and we've done that experimentally, and it worked. Um, is you can kind of dig out instructions on the web and then tweak them a bit so they actually work and it works. Um, and I heard today that you can have two CMSs on your same CV database, have WordPress and Drupal on it, and it's, it seems unbelievable. And, but if that's true, then that would definitely be inter interesting to think about. Um, um, so, but in retrospect, um, WordPress security is pretty good. Um, uh, Drupal major releases are not backwards compatible, so when it comes 
time to move from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 or Drupal 9 or whatever is ready by then. I, I believe both of them are under development. Or is it Drupal 10? Anyway, there's, anyway, there's, there's different Drupals in the future and they're not compatible with the one we've got. Um, so we would have to do a fair bit of work, uh, presumably, to get from one to the other. Um, WordPress is way easier for our comms department, um, and it's even easier for IT. You know, it's it's it's, it's great, um, and Caldera Forms might be up to the task. Um, so we're just watching it. Um, it looks pretty promising, especially with the work that um, Agile we have been doing. Um, so. Anyway, so we've got both, and it's it's not too bad. It's a little bit awkward at times, but um, so for instance, we had to put a bit of work in trying to make our Drupal site look more or less the same as our uh, WordPress site, so that when you switch from from the WordPress site and click on a button, it takes you to a form over here. Um, we wanted it to not look alien. Um, so um, anyway, uh, that's just a bit of a bit of a discussion. Um, so. Now, in terms of um, hosting, hosting and security, um, we we went with Agile Ware um, for the support and hosting, mostly because our main developer had used them before and hadn't had problems, um, and but also because we don't want to be tied as individual developers um, to to running a system that we host in the building, um, and if it falls over, we're responsible, or if um, or if we move on then um, nobody's there to support it. So we really need the third party support. Um, and I believe our site's on an Amazon based server, um, which seems to be okay. Um, so um, there was some um, part of that in, involves using Cloudflare. Um, and the benefit of Cloudflare is that it protects us against denial of service tax and various other things. Um, so for instance, it'll be a bit sniffy about you if you're coming through a proxy. Um, and um, it should speed things up a little bit, um, depending how you use it. If we had our website on it, it would make more of a difference, I think. Um, but um, just for CV, um, it's, it's not all that different in speed, I don't think. Um, it does cache things. Um, a little bit annoyingly sometimes. So, for instance, we've got this um, plugin uh, custom extension doing tagging that I mentioned earlier, and um, it caches the config file somehow and um, keeps reading the old file. And so, there's a few little minor issues about caching. Um, and it also times out after 100 seconds, um, meaning that the other day when I was doing a whole lot of imports, I could only do them, say, a thousand at a time. I had to do 10,000, so each time I did an import, I had to do 10 imports, um, which is a bit of a drag. I would rather just sit and wait, you know, make a cup of tea while it imports for half an hour. Um, another thing about, sorry, I'm sorry to put the boot into Cloudflare like this. <laughs> um, um, Cloudflare, you can get an SSL um, connection, HTTPS, um, on your website. Um, and if you use Cloudflare, it actually breaks that, it breaks the chain of trust. So it's SSL all the way to Cloudflare, and then it's SSL all the way from Cloudflare to your site. But from the user's point of view, unless they kind of click in and read the certificate, they won't necessarily realize that they haven't got an encrypted connection all the way to your site. Um, it's, it's, and you're trusting, it's, it's just another party that you have to trust then um, because they're getting unencrypted. Um, transmission of your CV data. Um, so, anyway, I won't um, say anything more about Cloudflare, but otherwise, apart from that, it's working fine. <laughs> um, um, in CV, you can set up word replacements, um, which we liked because it meant we could replace the word contribution with payment and organization with organization with an S. Um, and a few other things. Um, so it's not that hard to set up. You can just find it in the menu and define your word replacements and then right through your interface, um, whenever it did say contribution in the boilerplate CV, um, it will now say payment. Um, so, and there's some exceptions. So for instance, if you run a report, your column headings, I think will still hold the, will still show the old, the old words. 
um, but it's, it's not, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Um, you'll be wanting to set up your permissions. Um, so there are, as um, it's been touched on, there are Drupal permissions, um, which, which are quite nice to use, and CV permissions. Um, and they're separate, separate permission systems. Um, roughly speaking, Drupal permissions um, can be used to limit access to, to sets of custom fields, for instance. Um, so, for instance, we've got uh, a, set, a custom field set for our volunteers, recording all the information we keep about them. Um, so, in the Drupal permissions, we can we assign roles, uh, uh, set up roles, and then each role has a has very fine grained Drupal permissions. And one of those is you can restrict access to um, to particular field sets, um, like volunteer fields. Um, and I think I've got that right. Anyway, it's roughly right. <laughs> um, whereas if we wanted to restrict permission to particular uh, contacts in the database, um, as opposed to particular parts of a contact record. So for instance, we have um, a concept of a restricted supporter who might have requested particular anonymity, so there should be only visible to the CEO and the fundraising manager. Then we can't do that with um, Drupal permissions, which kind of cut across, across the fields. Um, you need to do that with CV access control lists and then you can put those people in a group and restrict access to members of that group um, using a CV permission. So it, it depends. We we try to avoid the CV um, access control list ACLs, um, just to keep things simple and just to keep it to Drupal permissions. Um, but we know we're going to come across them before too long, especially when we import all our clients. Um, so. Um, yeah, and the roles the roles work quite well. Um, it's tempting to set up roles for, um, for instance, every job you have in the building, um, or even by individual people. But it, the way we do it is um, um, by role we really mean a functional role. So, for instance, we have a role for for people who can send mail outs, uh, use Civi Mail, um, and we give them access as they need it. Um, and then um, we'll have another role for called like fundraising admin, um, and then and then a particular, um, what do you call it, like a physical role, like an actual person um, might have might have access to mailings, they might have access to fundraising admin, but not to volunteer admin and not to payments or whatever happened to be. So you kind of you kind of mix and match your your functional roles to make up your actual roles. Um, and that works quite well for us rather than rather than having to define all the permissions for the fundraising manager, and then all the fun, all the permissions for the fundraising coordinator, um, which can get a little bit, a um, little bit too fine grained. Um, and in the menus, we moved around stuff in the menus. It's not very hard to do. You just um, you can just edit your menus and and just kind of drag them around. Um, you need to set um, on individual menu items. You need to do a little bit of uh, fiddling with the permissions to make them. To make them turn up for the right people, but um, um, mostly we just move things out of the admin menu um, to make them visible to users who weren't admins, um, and we moved other things into the admin menu just to declutter and and um, get a few things out of the way that we didn't want people messing with. Um, all right, so um, next is um, I'm going to talk about the structure a little bit more. Um, this is a little bit of a view of our structure. It might be a bit small to read, but um, just to know that it's, it gets complex fairly quickly. Um, um, so, so we would say you want to start by defining the scope of your migration. Um, so, for instance, you might just have a, one database that you're moving to Civi, um, or you might have more than one database and spreadsheets and documents and dedicated inboxes and, and um, paper lists, and, and we had all of those things. Um, so um, you need to list it out and, and more or less get, get approval to say we're only going to migrate these things or we're going to migrate these things by this time and then these things we'll work on later. Um, and um, otherwise people will get surprised later on when 
you're still using such and such a spreadsheet to do something. Um, and they said, but you said everything would be in CV, so don't say everything would be in CV because it'll take time to get everything in. Um, so, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's just basic project management stuff, but you need to work out your timelines and your agreed outcomes and so on. Um, it can be helpful to do a sort of a, what I call an input-output analysis. So if you, if you think of your current system that you're replacing with CV as being uh, consisting of particular spreadsheets and inboxes and, um, and databases, um, it's helpful to look at when data goes into them and how it goes in um, and what you're pulling out of it. So for instance, your inputs might include forms, uh, people typing stuff directly into spreadsheets or into um, uh, or updating fields in spreadsheets or in your databases um, and any inputs you're doing. Um, and outputs might include statistics that are being pulled out, uh, pivot tables, uh, reports, the sheets themselves if they're being read off and someone's dealing with people on the phone and reading data off a spreadsheet. Um, sometimes you get manual counting. So um, uh, all of these things um, you you'll need to be thinking about how you're going to how you're going to do them again in CV. Um, and there, uh, there's also I, I I include the screens themselves, so the screens in your databases and so on, as being outputs, um, because people are going to be reading off them while they're while they're dealing with problems. Um, and then you might want to add a few outputs. So so we weren't reporting on as many things as we we would like, um, and a bunch of things people said we want to know this statistic or that statistic. Um, we basically said, look, we can't do it until we've got CV. Um, and then we put it on the on the list. Um, so um, um, from that, you can make a list of all the all the stuff you'll need to store, all the data you'll need to store. Um, and um, we did that in a great big list um, in a spreadsheet. Um, it actually it turned out to be a few different iterations and a few different lists, and it was quite messy, but. Um, but at least after a while, you kind of you get a feel for all the all the data you've got over there and all the data you've got over here. Um, it helps to do block diagrams and then and then drill into a bit more detail so that you're not missing stuff. Um, but if you do miss stuff, it will become apparent when you implement it in CV, and you can add it in afterwards. Um, so um, then you'll need to work out how you want to store everything in CV. Um, and it will be worth keeping in mind how you're collecting it, um, how it's going to be used, and how you're going to report on it. Um, so um, you'll end up with a list of forms um, for getting stuff in and a list of reports for getting stuff out. Um, and um, uh, the f yeah, um, I'll, I'll get back to this a little bit in, uh, soon, I think. Um, once you've um, once you've got a kind of a rough idea and a document or spreadsheet or something specifying um, what you're going to put in um, to CV and what you're going to store there, um, and a rough idea of what forms you're going to have and what reports you're going to have and so on, um, you just need to go over it with your stakeholders a couple of times um, until everyone's happy, um, and then I would say um, put something together in CV. Um, early, um, even if it's a long way off launch, um, just so that you can show you can show people roughly what it's going to look like um, and put a bit of test data in. And it's it's quite it's quite important to to show someone an actual CV screen and just poke around a bit and say this is a contact and this is how you edit their address, even if there's nothing else in there. Um, because otherwise there's this kind of fear that comes with the thing that you haven't seen. And it's this scary CV database that, that nobody knows quite what it is. So it certainly helped me when I first saw CV. <laughs> I um I felt much better about it and and started um, messing around. Um, Stephen, who we've been work, working with, um, reminded me to add that you should leave a paper trail and document um, more or less everything everything that you plan and everything that you do um, as you go. Um, so that you know 
what you did and why you did it. Um, and um, you you need to do that for, for, for getting buy-in from your stakeholders as well. Um, once they start using it, um, you'll be able to show um, it's 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 quite important for uh, I guess you'd call it accountability. So so for instance, um, some a manager might come back to you and say, "I thought we said we were going to do it in such and such a way, um, and you were going to use this approach field and that, that approach field," um, and you can point to your documentation and say, "Well, we made about that six months ago and documented it, and here's the document." Um, so knock yourself out. Um, um, so there's that, um, and we, because we were importing um, payments and financial data, it was a chance for us to talk to the accountant um, about what um, what line accounts we're using for the organisation for the accounting, um, and essentially to streamline them um, at the same time as um, matching CV to them. So, um, so we've got, I think. To eight or ten, um, um, I'm not really an accountant, so I'm not really sure what they're called, but I'm going to call them line items. <laughs> um, so we've got donations and we've got regular donations and grants and um, 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 event fees and various other categories. Um, and in our previous system, we had to kind of massage them to make, to to make them match up, so what was coming out of e-tapestry and what was going into, I think what was Reckon at the time, um, was quite difficult to do. Um, took the poor old accountant uh, quite a long time each month to reconcile. Um, and now we have the same the same basic items, the same basic financial types in um, in CV as we do in in Zero, um, and it's much much easier to manage. Um, and you'll have to take care of things um, that might or might not attract GST, um, like event fees, membership fees, and so on. And of course, if you're a non, uh, if you're a for-profit business, then it's going to be more likely to attract GST. Um, you can handle that in CV, um, but I can't go into the details about that. Um, um, so, where have we got next? Um, so we, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about contact subtypes. Um, I'm calling this section contact subtypes and how to avoid them. Um, we, we started with a bunch of, um, contact subtypes. So, so, um, as we've seen the, the main contact types are individuals, organizations and households and, um, um, typically, you want to break up organizations into organization subtypes and individuals into individual subtypes. So we had a few for um, individuals, for example. We had regular donors, um, staff members, volunteers, um, workplace givers, I think bequesters, and a bunch of others. Um, and we've got rid of um, um, most of them. So for instance, with regular donors, we were recording when they started. Um, when they received a welcome letter from us um, and um, we had fields in there for their credit card expiry um, so that we could um, contact them when it came time um, and we've just dumped that subtype altogether and we use smart groups instead um, that um, monitor their payment patterns um, and this way they stay up to date. We can work out when they started by looking at their payment history um, and um, we can work out if they've lapsed and so on, and we use eWay to track down their um, their expiry dates. Um, <clears throat> we still keep um, contact subtypes for volunteers, um, basically because the custom fields are um, genuinely useful to us, um, and they're unique to volunteers. So I guess the moral is um, just be a little bit careful with with contact subtypes because they're quite they can be quite attractive, but um, if they're not necessarily, you'll end up, if, yeah, if you don't really need them, you'll end up duplicating your data. Um, so, so for instance, with our regular donor start dates, there's a start date on their payment record, and then we're typing in a start date into their, into their regular donor, um, um, field set, and, um, guaranteed that one of them's going to be wrong eventually. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit more about redundant redundancy. Um, I've got a couple of examples. In in our old database, we had a checkbox on every contact um, that just said donor, and um, and the idea was that if they if they donated, then someone would check the box, and it was a manual checkbox, <laughs> and um, it's easy to see how that might have gone wrong. Um, before long, we had hundreds of contacts where the box was ticked and there was no donation, and we had others who donated and nobody had ticked the box, and we just started ignoring it, and it just uh, kind of cluttered the screen. Um, and later on, we had um, uh, regular donors, and so I've talked a little bit about regular donors. We had a regular donor status field to try to make it easier to identify them, um, and they'd drop in and out, and the status wouldn't be kept up to date. And so we were contacting donors as though they were still donating, and um, we weren't contacting the ones who were now donating. Um, so, um, so um, the moral is, if you need to record something, this is a well-known programming principle, um, then you should record it um, in one place um, and not in two places. Um, and quite like this. There was um there's a, a seafaring seafaring advice which is that you should um, um take one chronometer to sea or three chronometers to sea but never take two chronometers uh, and and I'll let you think about that. Um, um so um so for example we have a um we have a staff um status field. Um which can be either current or former. Um, so um, it's just a matter of checking it every now and then and updating it. But um, it's generally pretty close. And if we look up the staff list, we can fix it up. And it makes it very easy to contact all the staff or um, exclude them from a mailing or whatever it happens to be. Um, and of course, it's only as good as the maintenance, but at least it's, it's definitive. Um, from Civi's point of view, we've only got that information in one place. Um, and um, as an, another example, we sometimes record um, the employer of a contact. Um, so what we had in our old database was a field um, for putting in the name of the employer. Um, and um, now instead of doing that, we have the employer as a contact. Um, we might not have much information about them apart from the name, but at least they're in Civi. Um, and then we define a relationship, and later on, if we find out more about the contact, we can add it to their record. Um, and that way, uh, we don't have the employer's name in, in two places. Um, so, um, let's see. Um, uh, I mentioned the tagging system before, um, which lets us use tags without, without doing the information du duplication. Um, where we use um, smart groups and and update the tags relating to those groups automatically. Um, um, something else I wanted to mention was um, what you might call time bound, time bound data versus time independent data. So um, something like um, something like a payment or or most activities um, you would consider as um, time bound. So it might be relevant for a couple of weeks that somebody attended such and such an event or that um, somebody made such and such a payment. Um, but typically you want that information to slip into the past in their activity record or their payment record. Um, so for instance, if we make a referral of a client to the health service, um, rather than having a checkbox saying referred to the health service and that being a permanent feature of their record, <laughs> um, we would have an activity for that which then which can be scheduled and then completed or cancelled, and it will slip into the past. Um, so that way, you you if you can identify things that would be better as activities rather than as uh, custom fields, then it's it's a good idea to get them into activities um, so that they don't clutter up your pages. Um, um, so it's it's basically the difference between transient and permanent things. So 
Um, obviously, nothing's really permanent, but um, um, but things like staff uh, staff status um, are permanent enough to have a custom field, whereas um, whereas an event uh, attendance or something like that is not. Um, um, so, for instance, we could have had an activity saying employed as a staff member, and another activity for saying left employment. Um, but because we don't need the history for that, um, we really just want to know whether they're a staff member now. Then, um, and it's the same with volunteer status. So we use custom fields for those. Um, another example: we like to thank regular donors after they after they sign up. Um, so rather than, um, for instance, having a tick box, um, we use a thank you activity and and um, schedule it when they when they, it gets automatically scheduled from the from the web form when they sign up, um, and then we use dashboard reports to find regular donors that have um, started in the last couple of months but don't have a thank you activity recorded on their account in the last couple of months. Um, so that'll pull up everyone that still needs to be thanked. Um, and that sits on the fundraising coordinators dashboard and you can tick them off one by one. Um, um, so for... Um, uh, I miss my don't repeat yourself slide. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Um, and for our um, migration, um, we chose July 1st to launch our um, CV. Uh, we started with our financial and supporter database, um, and we just wanted the financing, the financial reporting to work out nicely. Um, and but setting a date well in advance gives you gives you a nice um, deadline to work towards. Um, and even if you move the date, like if you had a date, you'll probably work a bit harder towards it. <laughs> um, um, also, um, the actual migration process itself, if, you, if you've worked out what fields you're moving to before you start, it sounds obvious, but um, if you just kind of assume that you're going to move the fields that you have um, across to CV as they are, then um, you might find it's a bit uh, more difficult or you'll end up reproducing the mistakes of the past. Um, so um, it's much better to have a, have a good look at, look at your fields in advance. Um, set them up in CV and then work out how you're going to get the data from over here to over here and you will probably be doing that with spreadsheets. Um, so uh, certainly you're going to need CSV files to import into CV unless you do something fancy with your database. Um, so we just developed a whole lot of spreadsheets and formulas um, and then we practiced it uh, a few times. So we've dumped all the data out um, import it into our fresh CV um, and try it out and and at more than once we would just, just um, clear it out again, do it all again um, and um, until we're happy with it and we also got an idea that way of how long it would take um, because especially with some of the import limits and stuff it can be quite time consuming um, so um, so we worked out that we could probably do it in a weekend and it ended up taking a day. Um, and um, yeah, it worked well. So so you want, um, you'll probably want to log everyone out of your old systems um, or do it on the weekend um, and um, just do the migration all at once before you launch, just before you launch. Um, our launch um, July 1st happened to be on a uh, Monday which was um, convenient, so we did it over the weekend leading up to the Monday. Um, uh, if, it, um, if it fails, <laughs> then, um, then just stay with your old system. So don't dump your old system immediately. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, just, just kind of keep it ticking over for a day or two. Um, we kept our old system for two or three months, um, our old um, supported database. Um, and we had a few regular donors still ticking over in the old system. We hadn't been able to contact. And I'm running out of time. I'm very much sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and um, 
one thing I did want to say was um, don't be worried that you have to have everything done um, by launch time. Basically, if you've got a basic CV set up with the basic fields, you can work around almost everything that's missing, almost everything, um, and then you just add reports one by one and you get this lovely sense of constant improvement from then on, um, and that's what we're going through now. Um, so um, so in conclusion, in conclusion, I would say um, decide why you're doing it and, and tell, um, tell everybody why. Um, choose a platform, set up your hosting, do that soon. Um, define the scope um, and list your existing data structures. Focus on your data structures. Don't worry so much about your flow charts. Um, and then um, map out your new CV, mock it up, set a date, develop your migration spreadsheets, practice it, do the launch, and then be prepared, be prepared to spend a lot of time afterwards um, mopping things up and improving things for months and months afterwards. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. Um, I just thought, I, I've got one question. Um, but also, I mean, that, that last point, you know, get the data in there and then you can manipulate it in there. And particularly if you're doing an import, you know, consider just putting an extra column in your table that you're importing that is nothing other than a tracking number that's going into a tracking field so that if your import blows up or you know that you need to do something different, you've got a tracker in your data that you can use to figure out what you need to roll back. Mm. Um, my quick question, do you, do you use summary fields? Do you know do. summary fields yeah. extension? Yeah. I just wanted to give a plug. I don't know who built the extension. Oh, Stu. Stu? Somebody built an extension, and it's a brilliant extension. It's yeah. called summary fields. And if you enable it, you can then enable a whole bunch of, show me the total contributions of this person as a calculated field. Show me yeah. the last 12 months. And they're all calculated fields, and they're therefore available to you to use in lots of other places, like tokens in... Things and it's we've got it and we love it. It's yeah. the progressive technology That's right. PTP. Yeah. 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 Hey, look. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Peter. We'll um, we'll switch topic. Thank you, guys. For Patrick. Yeah.